has unlimited potential. Having each one of them be dis discovering their contributor that has been cheering from far and near, including I think those that are giving us, uh, if you want to look at it negatively, but good feedback. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yang bagi Tan Sri Yang Mulia Raja Tan Sri Datuk Sri Ashraf bin Raja Tun Ida Chairman Board of Trustees of Yayasan Amir Yang bagi Profesor Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak Board of Trustees Yayasan Hasanah and Chairman Board of Directors Deepad Services Tan Sri Zarina Anwar Trusty Yayasan Hassan Puan Shahira binti Ahmad Bazari Managing Director Yayasan Hassan Cik Shanas Al-Sadat Managing Director Deepak Services Mereka Rahat Trusty Sembang Members of Yayasan Hassan Yayasan Amin and Deepak Services Mereka Rahat Senior official from the Ministry of Education, Professor Charles Hopkins, the UNESCO Chair uh, on orienting teacher education to address sustainability. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good morning. I am very pleased to be here at this public lecture by Professor Charles Hopkins on the importance of 21st century learning and reorienting teacher education towards sustainability. Before I proceed, I would like to thank our host, Yayasan Hassan, Yayasan Amin, and Leave at Services, Member Hart, for taking the lead towards translating great ideas into actions. And I'm also pleased to note that trust school programs under the public private partnership between the Ministry of Education and Yayasan Amir is now its fifth year and has come a long way from its humble beginning in 2011 from 10 pilot schools to 83 schools in 10 states. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Charles Hopkins remark, and I quote, enough for all, forever. These simple concepts provide the starting definition for the complexity of sustainable development and help frame the global search for solutions to the social, economics, and environmental issues that threaten the planet. The world's population passed the 1 million mark in 1810, doubled in the next 100 years, and reached 7 billion by 2050. The projection for 2050 is 10 billion. The issue here is not simply pure numbers but rather about sustainability and resources where tomorrow's citizens will need to provide for these 3 billion additional citizens while using less water, less arable land and with access to fewer ocean resources. We are all living in an evolving world. Technology is evolving. Family life is evolving and even vulnerability, vulnerability, vulnerability is evolving. In the increasingly borderless world today, the notion of global citizens, first coined close to 30 years ago, is now common practice. Even some primary school students have started to learn coding, mostly online, taught by teachers from across the oceans on different time zones. Never before has the world had more knowledge, more technology, more wealth, and the ability to address these needs. But at the same time, the world is now witnessing increasing disparities in wealth and income. According to one estimate, 
1% of the world's population own 50% of global wealth today. Global conflicts continue to draw attention to the need for building a culture of peace. Unsustainable production and consumption patterns are creating ecological impacts and sustainability of life. All these developments have significant impacts towards the whole education system, from policy to classroom teaching process. The change is inevitable. What is more important is how we harness the power of change for the betterment of our society so that no one is left behind. And education cannot be separated from society. Development in the real world and current challenges at any point in time have always led us to revisit the perennial questions as educators. What should our students know, be able to do, and value enough to act upon when they graduate? And Malaysia has a long history of adapting to evolving national and global mega trends. Post our independence in 1957, given the zeitgeist of the of that time, greater focus was given towards strengthening unity and equity. The industrialization and the new economic policy era of the 70s to 90s brought about greater emphasis on science, technology, mathematics, trades, economics, and engineering. This momentum continued well into the new millennium with spotlight given to digital literacy and computers supplementing many of our classrooms. And as mentioned, we are fortunate because for a long time our government has allocated quite a significant portion of our annual budget for education. The sector continues to receive the largest share at over 20% of the total allocation which is among the highest in the world. And Ministry of Education is committed to provide equal access to education and improve the quality of education system in the country. Positive changes are taking place in the classroom, in the pedagogy, in teacher training, in curriculum and co-curricular design, and in assessment procedures. We aim to scale up efforts to provide a more diverse and flexible education pathway. And this covers the technical and vocational education and training and post secondary options. And to accommodate students with specific and special needs. Hence, thanks to the strong support from the Malaysian government, the Malaysia Education Group 2013 2025, launched in September 2013 has recorded some notable achievements over the past three years. And these include increase the number of schools of high quality, reduce urban rural achievement gap, increase English literacy among primary students, improve quality of teachers and school leaders, and greater parents and community involvement in our children's education. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the success of any education system depends largely on the quality of the teachers. The ministry aims to get the best into the system and have put into place more stringent selection criteria to recruit from the top 30% of SPM holders in the country into the teaching profession. In addition, to ensure students acquire the knowledge and skills to succeed in the 21st century, the Ministry of Education embarked on the important task to upskill 268,589 teachers with 21st century pedagogical skills with greater focus on literary thinking skills. In addition, Nearly 1,000 schools nationwide have embarked on the 21st century classroom pilot project. Students are now more responsible and involved towards their own learning with more opportunities for project-based learning, presentations, and peer assessment 
with the teachers. As we move towards a fully developed nation, it is imperative that we aim to be at par in terms of excellence in education globally, whilst being mindful that excellence is not limited to how many A's students should score in their exam. It is also our responsibility to ensure that all stakeholders, including teachers, parents, students, staff, policymakers, and funders, among others, collectively become active players in shaping our world to create an environment in which is sustainable for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, with that kind of environment, a classroom is not just limited to within the traditional four walls, but expanded to every inch of the universe. And with that, I hope we will all join hands to shape the future learning experience for our students and for Malaysia to be one of the countries leading the way towards 21st century learning. Thank you to all who made an effort to attend this public lecture. And I believe that everyone is now looking forward to hearing from our honorable speaker today. Congratulations, congratulations to the organizers, and thank you for having me here. And may I wish you happy Chinese New Year, happy holiday, long live Pakistan. Thank you, Wabillah Taufiq Wadhaya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, dan salam sejahtera yang berbahagia tansi-tansi dan terdatuk rakan-rakan hadirin yang dihormati sekian uh, saya telah ditugaskan untuk mengendalikan sesi syarahan uh, umum oleh Profesor Charles Hopkins uh, dengan ini saya rasa amat terpuja dan terhormat dalam tugas yang diberikan ya. uh, ini adalah satu majlis ilmu uh, therefore I will dispense with all the formalities Uh, we want to get straight into the crux of the matter And oleh itu saya uh, mengajak saudara-saudari uh, Menghayati ceramah ini Dengan berfikir tentang apa yang perlu kita lakukan untuk masa hadapan Seperti mana yang diceramahkan oleh uh, Yang berbagai Tan Sui Khair tadi uh, Masa hadapan kita bergantung kepada pendidikan Dan dalam konteks ini kita bergantung lebih kepada sekolah amanah What can we do for the trust school moving into the future, particularly in the 21st century? Right? Let me give you a little bit of my take on what the 21st century is all about. I am a 20th century learner. And most of us are 20th century learners. Okay? And suddenly we are catapulted into this 21st century thing. And half of us do not know what this is all about. Many of us are still grappling in trying to understand what 21st century, so 21st century learning is all about. We have our Professor Charles Hopkins here. is someone who could take us to that journey of what the 21st century uh, education is all about. Okay. But from my point of view, 20th century education for me is contextualized on what I call the three M. The first M is about man. Second is M is about machine. And the third M is about mind. M now has been reduced to what we call the human capital. Basically, the human capital theory talks about human capital is about the economic interests of the individual. Full stop. Yeah? And therefore, if you are training people for human capital, all you are interested in the individual and his economic interests. Right? And I don't know whether that is 21st century. Machine, we are now being reduced to high tech high-tech center. Everything is high-tech, digital world, and so on and so forth, as though there's a panacea for our own problem in this context of education. And M, mind to me, is basically this materialistic economic thinking. Everything now is directed to the economy, the rest is not important vis-a-vis -vis the human capital theory that we talk about. A very linear thinking in many ways, yeah? and therefore, we capture education in this context of As I think about what 21st century learning is about, all about, the imperative for me is not 3M but 3H. 
The first age is humanity. The second age is high touch. The third age is the heart. Humanity means we need to be human again. Beyond just the human capital. Because there are so many things is at stake as far as humanity is concerned. Not only within our classroom, but around the globe. As he just mentioned, we're going to have 10 billion people in the year 2050. Yet, in the end, early this year, Oxfam said eight people own 50% of the world assets. Last year it was 62%. Now this time it's only 8% owning 50% of the world assets. Next year, they're predicting only three people owning 50% of the world assets. And until and unless we start to think about humanity, then I think we are all going to go into a big issue as far as how discriminatory the world is and education needs to rectify this. Yeah. High touch to me is about human centric. It's not called technology centric. Technology to me is just a label. At the end of the day, we need to solve the human problem, the people problem. And the people problem is what is causing the mess in the world today. The disparity, the divides, and sometimes even the discrimination at the same time. Right? And last but not least, the question of the heart. Yes, you are right. The heart education is education of the heart. At what point do we educate the heart? We virtually do not even talk about the heart in our education system. And yet, this is a very fundamental issue of values. You don't, have the, you, don't, you don't get the heart right, you don't get the values right. You don't get the values right, everything will go wrong. Right? So that's my take as far as 21st century learning is concerned. And I hope as you go through this lecture by Professor Hopkin, please think about the transition from the 3M to the 3H. And how can we arrive at the 3H without discriminating the 3M at the same time, but also putting the 3H in its proper perspective. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Charles Hopkins. Charles has been uh, a good friend for almost more than 10 years now. I first met him in the year 2005 when the United Nations University launched the Regional Center of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development. He was one of the architects, Ray Charles, for this particular uh, structure called the Regional Center of Expertise, which is meant to be a precursor of what education would look like in the future. The structures of universities now, particularly in schools, may not last as far as education for sustainable development is concerned. We need a new structure, we need a new way of how to approach education given the question of sustainability. Yeah. And Charles, uh, we call him more fondly as Chuck. Yeah. Chuck is uh, also the UNESCO chair uh, in the University of York. Uh, reorienting teachers' education as for, uh, for sustainable development, for access to address sustainability. He has been a very dedicated, a very passionate person, traveling almost, I think you spend your time in, on the air, in the air probably more than on the ground. Uh, <laughs> 70 countries, 90 countries at one time advising. I know, I know this trip, he started from Toronto, he was in Germany, and then landed in Nilai, spent two uh, two day workshop in Nilai, and then was in Penang giving a public lecture and here for the next three days. And after this, you're going to fly to Germany again, go to Florida, and go back to Toronto, and I don't know where else. <laughs> so to catch this man is a kind of a, you know, a kind of detective work, but alhamdulillah is here, and therefore make use of it in terms of your knowledge and moving forward. Yeah. He's also the founder and a co-chair of Sustainability and Education Academy in Canada. It's a professional develop, development program designed to assist senior education officers and also leaders from Ministry of Education, school boards, facilities of education, reorienting K-12 school system to address sustainability. For five years, this program has worked across Canada and is now building an international aspect of school officials from countries including Finland, China, the Netherlands, and Sweden, 
and I hope Malaysia will also be included in that list not too long. Okay. Charles is also uh, awarded a number of honorary doctorates and also several honorary professorship fellowship including the Royal Society of UK, Salzburg Seminar and also holding senior advisory position, civic medals, national awards and the silver jubilee medal from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. So we are really very fortunate to have Chuck here with you. May I invite you Chuck to deliver your... We will spend 45 minutes on the lecture and after that we will open this for discussion and I will invite you to give very, very hard questions for you to answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please start. Go and say Father Troy. Yeah. Uh, I, I am so sorry that I'm flying out at midnight tonight. I would love to have stayed for this weekend. I, I have, uh, <clears throat> we have a, a good uh, uh, representative from China in, in Toronto. We have 500,000 uh, Chinese living in, in the city. And, uh, but it would be wonderful to see uh, in an Asian uh, setting what's there. At any rate, uh, <coughs> Director General uh, Tan Shri, uh, Dr. Payne, uh, and Tan Shri Raza, yes. and the Chair, um, Managing Director, Jeanette, all for that. Honorable <coughs> guests and, and the distinguished people who have uh, come out here this morning, appreciated, and fellow educators. Let me begin by saying how I appreciate the opportunity to come back and to address you. Uh, almost two years ago, I was here, and um, was able to give a, uh, a talk. In a way, it, it was a precursor. It was a bit ahead of its time in that we were really <clears throat> talking about sustainable development and how to embed it in, in the Leap Ed program and working with the trust schools in this. And since that time, it has now been adopted by ministers of education all around the world. So we were slightly ahead. And I'm hoping that after this morning, uh, we can keep that, that bit of a head start uh, in looking at this. Now let me talk to you a little bit about the, the overview of what I hope to do this morning. And uh, I apologize, so if, if uh, I, I've been told that I had an hour and then an hour and a half, so I, I may go over the 45 minutes. But I, uh, in the old days, remember when we had overhead projectors? It was so easy, right? Put those two aside and you'd be back on time. It doesn't work that way with the computer where it's one after the other. It's sort of a bit of a step back. But at any rate, what I want to do is, is to talk to you a little bit at the beginning about sustainable development. Uh, uh, the Director General really helped in that in his opening remarks, so I don't have to spend too much time talking about some of the issues. But in particular, I want to get in to the role that education plays in sustainable development. This is what has really changed since the time I was here before, where I was talking about it should be there, and now where ministers of education not only uh, have adopted that it should be, but there is a global monitoring effort that was going on where countries are going to be called upon to report on what they're doing, and I'll mention that. Then I want to talk about 20, uh, 21st century education and education for sustainable development. I can't just talk totally this morning about it, but I was asked to talk about it in a context, Education 2030, so it'll be in that way. Then I want to move on to ESD and, and the current perception of education quality. As I move around talking to different ministers of education and so on, they all say, well, yes, education for sustainable development, I've got to focus on my thesis course. And, and I think we, we can't really move unless we address that ultimately and on 
else. Right? So that's uh, also what I want to do. And then talk a little bit about moving forward, the work that is going on, and then uh, get to the, to, uh, to the Q&A. So we began this morning with the Director General talking about the, the kinds of challenges that are out there for society. We're talking about using less land and water, and in particular, ocean resources. It's from 1900 to now, we have depleted over 60% of the world's ocean resources. And our solution to that is to find better fish finders. It, it, it somehow, we are, we are missing out that we are simply going to destroy what is there. But there are many other, uh, other challenges that are up, and, and these are, 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 uh, are some of them. Overarching, I think, to, both uh, of the previous speakers uh, also talked about decent work, about uh, uh, social justice, about equity. It's not just about the environment. It, there are many, many threats uh, to, uh, to society that's there. But the big one is really how can we create an economic system that uh, both enables people to thrive and all uh, thrive, but at the same time not crash the planet. Crash, crash. It, it, uh, it, it is a, a, a huge, huge challenge. The, the Director General talked about a, a quote. Um, enough for all, forever. This came to me from an African elder. Um, it, it, you know, there is the definition of the, the Brooklyn Commission on Sustainable Development uh, and uh, the, the idea that it is development that meets the needs of the current generation without convention on future generations and, and so on. I love this one, enough. What, how much is enough? And for all, because it came from an indigenous person, we realized that for all isn't limited to humans. So it's for all. And I think that's an important component. Sustainable development itself, which was the best that we could negotiate in the 1980s that all world leaders would agree to. It's not perfect at all. It has many problems in it. It's very human centered, right? And saving what? And for whom? You know, that two for three percent. So those are underlying questions that are in there. And then forever, the intergenerational. And I want to come back to this concept of well-being. In, in the Scandinavian countries, uh, enough sounds like things. It sounds like stuff. And they want to look at it in a bigger perspective of well-being for all, forever. And, and uh, I'll, I'll come to that. Now, at, at first it seems like there's really, really uh, bad news. It's kind of a, a, of a downer. The world is crashing. And we have to be very careful as we bring this into our education systems that it does not become public. That it, 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 it is not something where you say, oh, what can I do? We have to have this kind of, of, of feeling, okay, we need to do something, and we can all do something, but what would be the most effective? And it's up to each one of us, whether, uh, you know, wherever we are, student or the, uh, the, the head of state, we all have access, we all have power, we all can do something. <coughs> now the good news is that now we have just we're at a really important time. 2015, 2016, 2017. Things are really changing. We had the Millennium Development Goals on this global level, in which we were targeting a handful of developing countries trying to raise their education level, social justice, gender issues, and so on. Now, 
we have come to the end of the Millennium Development Goals, and we now have a new era, 2015 to 2030, with the Sustainable Development Goals. And I'll talk about how these now apply to all countries, including Malaysia, and what, what will uh, what will we do. Now the good news is that around the, there has been a global agreement on the new goals. It was a huge process, two years uh, in the making. It targets all countries, and the funding is pledged. It isn't in the bank yet, you know, but it is pledged, and it's roughly $3 trillion. Now most of that money will be spent in their own countries trying to meet the targets and so on that, that have, been, uh, have been set up there. The big thing is that the corporate world is aligning. The, the pushback against Trump, even in the United States, by the corporate world, who have invested billions of dollars into trying to green their, their supply streams and their economy and their energy sector and so on, uh, and just playing to the oil industry, uh, it is not going down very, very well. Cities and states are really moving. On the same day that Trump was inauguration and announced that he was going ahead with the pipelines, California introduced the most stringent uh, uh, new rules on climate change. So we will see what happens. But at any rate, along with this, the new, the new goals came the idea of, of expanding the concept. And this is an important one, I think, for you. They removed the three social, environmental, and economic and re renamed them. Right? So social became people, and the environment became planet, and the economy became prosperity. But they realized those three needed two other things. Two other. Peace, and more importantly, for this group, I think, partnerships. They realized that the governments cannot move on their own, and individual segments cannot move on their own. What we need to do is explore ways in which we can form the kinds of joint partnerships that we, this is why I get so excited when I come back and, and see what is going on and talk with people here, because this is, you know, there are other programs that are going on in the world, but not quite as complex as yours. Yours is small. It's not like the German apprenticeship system. But what you do have is a very unique feature in that you have a center of collaborative curriculum development and professional development going on. It's not like the charter schools in the United States that reach out to business and industry asking for money, but not getting advice or how, how, uh, how to best station things. So this is, this is really an, an important component, the overall shift from three to five, and also in the various 17 targets and goals. The, the world leaders wanted five, but over the internet, under a program called The World We Want, people Millions of people insisted that the, that the targets be broadened. And finally, Ban Ki-moon uh, convinced the world leaders to go with what people wanted with all, all 17 of these targets. Now, you can see that goal four, the first one was addressing poverty and then hunger and, and health. But right after that is education. So suddenly, we find that education is in the forefront again. At Rio, the first time around, we were chapter 36, and we were the means of implementation that I mentioned. Now, they realize that without education, you're not going to have any of the others, really. So it is, it is a central place. Now what educators have to do is to maneuver and, and, and be there at the table as as other government departments are setting it up. Now the global goal for education, for each of these uh, 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 goals, there are targets that are set and objectives and so on. And so for, for 
sustainable development goal four is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning. What is so unique about this is that it's going to be extremely difficult to measure. And they do that. What is a quality education? Those kinds of things. And that will be up to, to nations to decide. No one tells a nation what to have in their education system. But the concept of inclusive, what is equitable? Is that treating everybody equal? Or is it taking the disadvantaged and giving them a bit more in the way of resources than others? So while it is an extremely noble goal, but it's going to be, uh, to be hard to get. And there are seven targets within it, and I'll come back to those in a moment. But there are some really unique key features in, in all of this. Uh, the first is that it, the, the principles is that it is universally relevant and it's based on education as, as a public good. That's not too different than what we've always thought about it. But it is expanded to access all levels of education. The targets include preschool at least one year. And it's moving from six years of free public education to 12. Every, everyone graduated with 12 years. There isn't a country in the world that's doing that now. So this is going to be an extremely important target to move towards. It's talking about affordable higher education access. Ministries providing lifelong learning and care and that. Uh, that has to work in partnerships with the corporate world with lifelong training programs as well. So how do we how do we bring that about in, in the reporting? So and these uh, these other aspects and I'll be leaving the, the PowerPoint for people to uh, to be able to look at later. So the targets as I say there's there are seven targets and three uh, recommendation, means of implementation, uh, in, in total, it, it is uh, fairly complex. But the first target, put it this way, is primary and secondary education. They, uh, as I say, 12 years is the, the new target. The second, 4.2, is early childhood care. Um, target three. Uh, 4.3 is, is also extremely important and going to be so difficult. It is focusing on technical and vocational education. At one point in my life, I was superintendent of curriculum with the Toronto Board of Education. And we pretty well got rid of our technical and vocational education programs. They just were not popular with parents. Parents didn't want their child in vocational education. They wanted them to be brain surgeons, or philosophers, and, and, and so on. Now we have to try and bring it back. There are two reasons. One is that not every child thrives in a general education. Not every child preferred learning style is reading. For two thirds of the world, it's either oral based, hands on learning, trial and that. The second thing, which may get governments to move, is that we need to bring in the workforce. Now, big business has their own training programs, but small enterprise, small to medium sized enterprise, which constitutes uh, over 95% of the world's commerce, they don't have a vice president of sustainability. They, they don't have their own training programs. So the scheme now is to go back and green technical and vocational education. So their graduates will go out into the workforce and help to green business. It's not as though suddenly we're going to have green industries everywhere. What we're going to do is green existing industries. And so it's a combination of giving our, our, our graduates not only green skills, but the ability to bring about institutional change and so on in the workplace. 
don't know how to do it yet, but that is, is uh, a, certainly a goal that we're moving towards. If we look at 4.4, and that's again the skills for work. The need to not only create decent jobs, but to have a skilled workforce. If we look at why countries educate people, you know, what is the purpose of education? Usually at the country or national level, it's quite different than why a parent sends their child to school. Countries are looking at international competitiveness and where do we have a skilled workforce and trying to build it, whereas the parent is looking at the best for their child's life. The, the 4.5 is, uh, is an important one. And this is one that here in Malaysia we're starting to work on, and that's how can we improve the education of indigenous and marginalized youth? And in the, please know that a number of your universities and so on um, are working on it, as well as the Ministry of Education is, is taking part in it. And uh, Dr. Razek is coordinating things here in, in Malaysia if you want to find out more about that. But looking at inequity is important. 4.6 is uh, numeracy and literacy, uh, especially lifelong learning, adult. And 4.7 is sustainable development and global citizenship. And now, when you get through this morning with my lecture, I hope that all of you will realize that actually education for sustainable development applies to all seven. And, and, and I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be making that point. Now, not only is it so important um, <clears throat> for education to have its own place at the table. It is because education also is a part of these other sustainable development goals. If we look, for instance, at, uh, at goal three, which is health. If, uh, if we look at, at gender equity, which is uh, goal five, you know, that, that whole thing of, of the, the, it is a global indicator which means that all countries will have to address this one and report on it. And that is the number of countries with laws and regulations that guarantee women age 15 to 49 access to sexual and reproductive health care information and education. Now, countries are going to have, you know, have to work around religion and work around uh, the politics and all the rest of it, but somehow, it, uh, this is all part of gender equity and so on, and, and, and the global, um, and then the decent work and so on. So those three goals, two more goals, responsible consumption and production, and of course climate change. So it's how can the Ministry of Education work hand in glove with other ministries? This is going to be very difficult in most countries where each ministry is a silo, different buildings and so on. How can the education department get the latest figures, the, la the, the latest real local information to put that in, in rebuilding really dynamic uh, uh, curriculum on the whole thing. Now, to ensure that this happens, what the ministers of education met in 2015 in Incheon, Korea. They looked at the Sustainable Development Goals and they agreed that Goal 4, all those seven points and so on, the 4.1, 4.2, that all of this would now be called Education 2030. And then they adapted that wholly. And they said in order to move forward, we're going to need the, the some inputs. And they have agreed to every year to publish a global monitoring report as to what, how well countries are doing in these various targets. Now, that first report is just out, and uh, you can find it on the internet. It shows that we have a very, very long way to go. 
if nothing changes, we will not achieve universal grade 12 education in, uh, in Asia, uh, probably until the year 2080, not by 2030, 2080. And in sub-Saharan Africa, it will be on into the next century until we do it. So things have to change. We have to address the dropouts. We have to address relevancy and so on and, and new ways. And that's why I think the research that you are doing in the trust schools will, will, it will help to make effective use of, of the limited resources that every, every country has. How can we move faster and more effectively? We need to make sure that our, our education systems are, are relevant. One of the things coming out of the reports, um, in half of the countries, and now I guess the United States will be one of those half, that do not mention climate change. As it is being removed from the website and so on. Who would have thought global change also applies? Now, if we look closer, it at uh, uh, role 4.7, the one that talks about, uh, 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 about education for sustainable development. I would like to take just a few moments and make sure that everyone understands really what education for sustainable development is. It is not understood very well by most countries and by most ministries of education or by most educators themselves. It is often seen as environmental education. It is often seen as, as a, a, another thing to add on to the curriculum. And, and this is what I want to clarify. I was part of, there were 10 of us who developed education for sustainable development as part of the real process in, 19, uh, in the 1990s, late 1980s, 1990s, to lead into the, earth, the first Earth Summit in, in 92. There were 10 of us, that, uh, and it was part of Agenda 21, which was the first action program or implementation program around sustainable development. It was called Agenda 21. There were 40 issues we could get world leaders to agree to. Now, there were many issues they wouldn't, such as earth control, such as alternative uh, energy. Okay. No, we're not addressing that. But there were 40 issues, and they were divided into four groups. The first group was around the social and economic issues. The second group were the environmental issues that we needed to address. The third grouping were addressing the people who normally are not there when big decisions are made, either at the UN or even in locally, in local government. So women, youth, trade unions, farmers, uh, uh, indigenous people. Uh, this was a cluster of nine, and that, that formed it. But the fourth group was called means of implementation. How, how are we going to do this? And that cluster included technology transfer. It, can, it included good science, basing things on science. It included monitoring and, and, and assessment. And it included education, public awareness, and training. So that is really where it came from. And we called it education for sustainable development. It's a part of pretty well every UN action plan comes out. There is a need for education, public awareness, and training. It, it, it's always there. It's just that normally ministries of education are not consulted, they are not brought in, and uh, they're just assumed uh, that they will do it. But of course, ministries of education, with their limited resources, don't go looking for things to do. It's, it just isn't there. So up till this point, now where we have Education 2030 and the ministers are saying, yes, we are a part of it and there will be the Global uh, Education Monitoring Report and so on. This is 
why I'm saying it is, it is such a, a change. The original concept, though, of education for sustainable development was that it was simply the contribution of the world's education systems. It wasn't a new discipline. It wasn't sustainability education. Some people are looking at that and, and adding sustainability education. But the vision was how do we use the world's education systems, the world's public awareness systems, and the world's training systems to do, in order to do that. And with, in that, education, public awareness, and training, we came up with four things that needed to be done. The first one was education itself, reaching people, access and retention in quality education. When we were doing this, it was still back in the late 1980s, and so it was the same time as John Kim, education for all, and we saw this was important. There were 120 million, we thought, roughly, of people for whom there was no school at all. How can you have any development, by the way? But there were hundreds of millions who were in very poor quality education, dropping out after two, three, four years, and so on. So that was, is the first one, and it is still there. So every one of you who is an educator are taking part in education for sustainable development. If you were focusing on access and retention and quality education. So you see that's goal 4.1, not just 4.7. And then the second one though is realizing it's our most educated countries that are leaving the deepest ecological footprints and many places and doing some of the greatest damage around equity, social justice, so bullying. So it's how can we reorient our existing education systems to address sustainability? Well, I mean, well, the fourth one, third, is public awareness and, and uh, it's more in line of government departments and so on. But we do need a, a citizenry that will, at the polls, support governments that are bringing in enlightened legislation that will repeal when, when the legislation that, that, that is against it. And we need knowledgeable consumers when you go and purchase things. You need to understand the whole life, the, the, the production, the product, where it's come from, where it's going, who made it, and who, that on going part and not just purchasing by price. A huge part of the population has to buy by price because they are living in abject poverty. But people who have any choice whatsoever, we need knowledgeable consumers who will support that, that, uh, that area. Now, I, to those of you who are educators, and I'm like, uh, this next slide will bring a little smile on your face. When I was the uh, superintendent of curriculum, uh, every, every week someone would come to me with a binder from an NGO. Would you just put this in the curriculum? And I would have to say, no way. I was trying to protect the teachers who, the realism though, is that each one of these things has a place and has a role. We call them adjectival educations, because you need an adjective in front of them. <laughs> what it is showing us is how inadequate an education that's based on six or eight disciplines really is in preparing someone for the real world. On the one hand, it's overwhelming. You know, whenever society gets a cold, educators, we get pneumonia. Right? It's our fault. You've got to do something about this, about drugs. Okay. And, and, uh, but we do have to take it to heart. What is an education, a proper education system, one that will prepare people for the world that we can't even envision what the world is. 
what are we going to do? So I had a, a graduate student prepare this for me. I, when I was there as a superintendent of curriculum, I felt that I, I was the keeper of a castle. And, and uh, I was under siege. And so inside the, uh, inside the castle, in, in, you know, where the king and queen, in the king, in, 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 the king and queen, math and language, they were, they were re really there in the very beginning. And then inside, and right around me, I, I, I had all the nobles. But what was happening is that, you know, all, all the adjectivals were, were coming around. Now, occasionally, I would need them. I had to prepare a curriculum on drugs or a curriculum on equity or, you know, that sort of thing. And so we bring them in, work with them, and then I'd have to put them out and wait and so on. But it, it is a problem as to how do we design a national curriculum? And how do we localize it? In Finland, for instance, we all usually score pretty high in the visa. One third of the curriculum is the national curriculum that is advised by teachers in consultation as to what should be there. One third is the district, the city or the region. And one third is that school itself. It, it is so that the, the curriculum is locally relevant, culturally appropriate, and, and that teachers believe in it because they know it. it. It's very, very different. Now, how do schools cope with education for sustainable development? You have this, this whole range uh, from ignoring it, I'm sorry, I'm busy, uh, through to events and clubs or vegetarian Thursday or you know, that sort of thing. Or the next level is where they, they teach about sustainable development in different topics. Uh, or above that, where they actually start reorienting their school system to educate for sustainable development. So not finding what they're practicing it, they're modeling it in everything they do. And then above that is where the school system works hand in glove with the local community. There's a program that, uh, that uh, Dr. Rezik talked about earlier, the Regional Centers of Expertise, that's the RCD, where the education system works with local government and business and industry and so on to try and actually build a more sustainable community. In doing that, in reorienting the whole institution, and I'll come back to this in a minute and talk about the benefits of doing this academically, it, it is we have to not only dream the curriculum, but we need to, uh, to look at things in, in a much more uh, complex way. Now, we had the UN Decade of Education for Sustainable Development, 2005 to 2014, and now the Global Program. Again, this is brought in by the world's ministers of education. It's not just something being imposed. This is the world's ministers of education have agreed to, and that is the Global Action Program now. And it's looking at what did we learn in in the, uh, in the decade, and how can we scale that up? How can we move that from, oh, that's nice on the outside, I'm glad you were experimenting with that. How do we move that into the core curriculum? How do we move it from the periphery to the core, and so on? And how do we move this into the nation of sustainable development plans? What is, where is education located in that? It's extremely important especially higher education. I say that because only about 4% of the world's population gets to go to higher education. But that 4% will probably become 90% of the leaders of your country. They will be the ones who will be the politicians, they'll be the senior civil servants, they'll be the religious leaders, they'll be the leaders of business and industry and so on. So we need to rethink the role of that education in doing and the Global Action Program is focusing on five things. One is advancing policy. So those of you who are here from the ministry, looking at where in the policy do we see social, environmental, economic, peace, partnering, those kinds of 
of things. And how can we embed the, the, the beachheads that, uh, that we've made? The second one is looking at and transforming learning environments, the whole school approach. Not just greening the campus, but greening the mind. What gets taught? What gets evaluated? What gets reported? So, what gets timetabled? What gets funded? That, that whole approach. And then, of course, we can't do very much unless we have professional development. Both the teachers and the principals and the leaders and so on, we have to have a clear vision. And I will get back to that. Now, one of the big changes, at the end of the UN decade, there was the largest gathering ever of ministers of education uh, that took place in Ichi Nagoya in, in Japan. And at that meeting, I, uh, I had the privilege of chairing the writing of the declaration. And in preparing the declaration, there were 30 people who were writers and I was chairing. Half of them were ministers of education. The other half, represent, they were representing constituencies like indigenous people, women, youth, and so on. Uh, and one of the, you know, just taking some excerpts from it, but a crucial one that was put in is asking ministries of education to go back and look at their purpose. Why are we educating people? Why? Because there is a huge shift that is going on in in, in it. And oftentimes, like when when I was a regional superintendent, and if I were to ask a grade three teacher, why are you educating people? First of all, they think I was pretty strange. You don't tell your boss. And, but the typical answer was, well, I have to get them ready for grade four. But at some point, we need to ask the, the overall picture, why are we educating people? Now, UNESCO, through the Delore Commission report, they, he looks at the purpose of education in these four things. To know, to do, to be, or to become all you can, that whole child approach, and to live together. It's this, the traditional, I think, 20th century holistic approach dealing with the whole child, the academic needs, their societal needs, their mental, their physical, their emotional needs, you know, there, there was that, that whole educating the whole child. But now, if we look at those challenges facing society that we began with, and the, the Director General mentioned in the beginning, I think that last one, to live together, we need to adapt to live together with others, with others, and sustainably. Who are the others? If we look at what is happening in the world now, the tensions between cultures, um, as we become more global, we have people who want to retreat more and, and, and the, the change that is happening. And the whole idea of this sinking well-being for all that uh, now the term well-being is quite often thrown around but I, I want to very very uh, briefly just this is from uh, from Finland there is a they put an awful lot of research by their National Science Foundation into what is well-being. Because they, they thought that, remember I said, enough for all forever. They wanted well-being for all forever. And well-being sort of it, it is this, where you take the environment that, that the child is born into, or that you are born into, um, the, the culture and the values, the public policy, the, you know, what was available to 
were born into a house that was on the internet or whatever. And then if you look at the resources and capability that you had, even your own physicality, well then how do you take that and, and being able to draw on this to, to bring it into successfully completing all of these kinds of things? And then how can you find meaningfulness in your own life? The comprehensibility and coping <coughs> And at the school, I was an advisor with the, the last relay, and they were looking at where does this appear in the curriculum? If this is a national goal and a purpose, where do these kinds of things fit? And they had the discussion around it, where teachers would be able to look at these different things, and how could you work that in, in into the program? And one of the things that they did is that they reduced the emphasis on the disciplines. They did not eradicate the disciplines, but they reduced the influence and looked at phenomena-based teaching, where they look at real things in real life and how can you, you funnel the disciplines through the, the reality and to try to put things into reasonable, reasonable uh, scope and so on. So the idea of taking that list and then learning, changing it to, uh, to add those two in it. Now let me move fairly quickly on to the, into the big issue. Where does the SD fit in with PISA? Now, as I said, the, quite often people say, well, I'd like to do the ESD, but we're focusing on PISA. Uh, and I think that what we have to understand is go back and look at the two. What are they? ESD is a purpose. One of the purposes of the education program. Whereas PISA is simply an indicator of our performance or our ability and so on. We do need them both. If you think that BSD is the first purpose is to get everyone into a quality education, then PISA is a way of, of, of understanding, are we getting there, are we not? But remember, PISA is simply an indicator of math, language, and science. It's not the purpose of education. They are indicators. And yet, because of the, how the press reports how well your government or your ministry and, and so on is doing, in terms of this was the purpose, the purpose of our education system was our score on PISA. Yeah. And we as educators are not good at being able to articulate that. Not good at explaining it and, and, and going through. So when we look at where are, how, you know, where, where does this all fit in? If we look at this side is reading and math sort of combined with where, where they fit. And this is science over here. The surprising one is Estonia. But there they have made education a top priority. And they put a lot of, they have very little, you know, they're just emerging, uh, an emerging economy. But they've made it as, as extremely important. And, and they are a small country. Everyone speaks that either Russian or Estonian. <coughs> they, they have two, and, and so on. <coughs> and you'll notice that China only handpicks as to what they're going to put into it. So uh, that's a bit of a, an anomaly as, uh, as well. But that's how well they do in the reading and math scores. I think another one that is extremely important is how well do they do in equity? So let me just explain this, because this is also a part of PISA that normally doesn't get out there. If we take, this is the median income in, in the country, and as you move this way, these are the people living in poverty. And if you move over here, then this is increasing in wealth. And these going up and down are the scores 
maybe six different levels, and each plot represents a school. So what they try to do is to go through statistically and draw a median line. And what you want to do is to have that line as horizontal as possible. So it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, you're at a school in a wealthy neighborhood, a school in a poor neighborhood. If you look at many of the developing countries, that scope is, in, that line does it falls way up in the wealthy, way down in the, in the other side. So the, there's a lot more to, uh, to PISA. Now, and as I say, it is compatible, and I'll come to that now as I'm beginning to, uh, to wind up. How do, how do countries uh, and what are educators doing to try and address that? Well, first of all, we're looking at, the, at a progression and not just staying and drilling and drilling at, for test scores at a lower level of understanding. We want to make sure that, for instance, in, in the overall learning process, that we begin with enjoying. It, 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 most kids, when they first start school, it, 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 it's exciting and it is enjoyable. However, we overcome that. <laughs> and so, but from enjoying, and then in the early stages, exploring what kinds of things are there out there to learn about and, and finding their interest. So, whether it's nature or reading or, or whatever it is, what are, you, what are you keen on? And then from there, it's learning how to learn. Uh, and then from there, learning with purpose. Whether it's eventually because you're passionate about something, or for learning from work, whatever. Then this is one that seldom do we move in our school system into having the students become responsible for their own learning. It's at this point we start to fall down and we come up with better selling techniques. <laughs> better ways of engaging and, and almost entertaining and bringing in the IT and all you know, that, and that sort of thing. And we never think that really we have to shift it uh, where they, uh, they become much, much more responsible for the whole thing. So that's one area. Another area that we're looking at um, is looking at the whole role of uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I know that for that STEM is an important part here. But what I would like to suggest is it's not just STEM, but it, it, if we look at STEM and ESD, it's STEM with a purpose. How do we build a more sustainable future? How are we going to invent that economy how are we going to invent products that are not going to be destructive to the world, they will actually be seen as an antidote to uh, things. There is a huge challenge out there for countries to, to, to rethink and, 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 uh, and become world leaders, global leaders, with that kind of a purpose. The idea of building on uh, aligning it with biomimicry Biomimicry simply means how does that thing happen in nature? I mentioned that a spider's web is stronger than steel. Abalone shell is strong. Where, how, without heat, pressure, and massive energy, and so on, it makes it, and at the end, it goes back into nature and totally So what can we learn from that? There's 4.7 billion years of free research out there <laughs> if, if we start looking into nature and, and how things are, are happening. If we look, as I say, with, with uh, TVET, this is, a, this is a, a tremendous area of, of rebranding, revitalizing, and serving our communities an awful lot better. If, if, uh, if we start working uh, with the, in general, in general, if we start looking at, at uh, uh, categories of, 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 of 
stages of learning. In the more traditional common are the early stages. Learning is an acquisition model where things go it's simply facts, uh, formulas, uh, true, false, right, wrong, those kinds of things, and skills. And then the next level up there is finding a, a, the analyzing, and then finally the highest level is the synthesis, evaluation, and engagement in actually doing something, becoming involved. And uh, what I'm, I'm leading to is the link to, to ESD. Because within Education for Sustainable Development, many of the issues are not true. Many of the issues we don't have a solution for. Now, if we look at those three categories that are traditional being down here, and then uh, uh, levels four and five and level six over here, it's that outer area where students need to be. That's where we, we need to really engage them with. with wicked is a British term for science that we really don't know the answers for. And we don't know what caused it you know, or, 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 or what is happening. It's where climate change was in the 1980s. And it, it's just real, it's not. We were supposed to be going into an ice age. So if you look at, down on one side, the measurability and the certainty. So if you have high certainty and high measurability, this is where most of our examinations and tests are, down in here. But this is the area that is easily replaced by robotics. This is the area that, uh, that uh, yes, we do need start there, but we can't stay there. What we have to be doing is working with real life issues that engage people in these others and slowly they build the confidence and the skills and the ability, the critical thinking, the ability to collaborate. Those kinds of things that are listed in 21st century education. The big problem is those fuzzy ones. People say, well, how do you measure? How do you report? And so what I would like to do is just share with you, here's a blue taxonomy with, from knowledge comprehension through to evaluation and creating, and uh, a little description of it. So previously learned information. And if we were to take it into this line of ESD and work the way along, and I, I think that you would be able, if we focus on this, and, and I would hope that, that that maybe um, Learn-In would be a partner with me in, 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 in exploring some of, of, of this. How do, we, how do we fill in this kind of a progression so that it becomes useful for people, not only here, but in the world? Now, I was in <clears throat> looking at how to bring this in on a big scale. The Vice Minister of Education for China asked, before, before I bring this in over the whole of China, or try to do it you know, in, in the whole of China, I have five questions that I need answered. And I took these five questions to a number of other either directors of education or uh, deputy ministers and so on, and said, how, how does how do these look as, as questions? And they said, yeah, we couldn't do much without it. So the first one is, how can ESB update and improve educational purposes and efforts? That's the typical piece of it. But then beyond that, how can it help to improve and enrich curricular development? How can we make the development more relevant and, and so on and, and the pedagogy? The third one was, how will this better prepare students for the world that they, they are going to live in? And the fourth one, how can it better serve the community? And the fifth one, how can ESD promote innovation in teaching and learning conceptual framework? What do we know about how people learn and, and how that whole thing? Now, I, I work in 18 of the 
fairly high scoring piece of countries that have researchers or colleagues in 18 countries who found school systems that had profoundly changed and embedded sustainability as their goal. One school in Mongolia rose from being an almost a nothing school to the number one school in the whole uh, of Mongolia by embedding global sustainability issues mining, destroying the water systems in their community. Uh, what was to become the number one academic school in Mongolia on standard tests. Now, what, in the, over three years, the 18 countries, and we brought it back together, and now we cannot prove the causality that it was ESD, but I'm going to share with you some of the, of what was reported by superintendents and principals in the, uh, uh, from their schools. And you see, these are the kinds of 21st century. And I'll click through them fairly, fairly quick. There are three of these. Uh, and as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving all this, but because of time, I'm trying to get to the question and answer period. Now, this, uh, and we will share with you where this is on the internet. It's a published paper, and a donor gave us the funds so that we could have put it up for free. Uh, this a publication, and, and you can find it and read it, the whole book. So, in summing up, in summing up around ESD and becoming the sustainable self, we do need to start with the core disciplines. We need to select the, the appropriate adjectivals, you know, bring them in, work with them, what are they going to need. We do need to address their professional skills, how are they going to earn a living, how are they going to contribute to society, and so on. Their personal attributes, there is mentioned the heart, morals, ethics. That has to somehow be in there. And then the whole thing of their own well-being and their worldview and so on. And the sum of all of this knowledge is what we think of as the sustainable self. Now, doing that is the issue. And I love using this image. Some planning and assembly will be required. <laughs> as, we, as we try to pull all of, of this together. And those of you who are principals and, and who are bringing about transformation within the schools, the idea that in transforming them, we need clarity of vision and purpose. We need these things. The teachers and the parents need to understand the reason why they are is this just because we, there's a new minister of education and wants to leave his staff or their staff? Or is this really, do I believe in my heart this is important and this is good? They have to understand, they have to know the changes being brought about, and they have to understand the, the essence of it. And we really need the professional development of our teachers, but especially school leaders. They need to reform, right? and they have to they, they need training. How do they deal with the teachers that have never done that before and not doing that? You know, and and, and uh, how, how does the system deal with that? Of course, they'll need resources. We need monitoring. We need to know where we're going. How are we developing standards? You know, the signposts along the highway and feedback to people here. We think this is working. Really do you think we should do about this? This isn't working quite so well. We need evaluation and, and success. And with that, with the success, we need celebration. It all leads up to a profound change of school culture, but so needed and so necessary. So now, so if you would come, come back yeah, okay. let's, uh, let's do the, uh, the reflections and the questions. Thank you very much. Professor Hopkins for that new vista that he presented on sustainable development. Certainly it is very new to many of us in the context of what it is to invest in 
dimension of the, this local dimension, the, the, the global dimension, and also not present, but very much in the future. So I will now open this discussion. Uh, please respond by using the mic. Uh, I can get the rope in my somewhere. Uh, please ask very pertinent question because I think it's something which is new for this. The new purpose of education. Maybe we have lost the old purpose for education, but the new purpose of education is something that we need to get to grips with before we can even talk about curriculum, pedagogy, and whatever else. Yeah. So, anyone, just introduce yourself very quickly and get into the question. Hi, uh, my name is Wati, so just use my voice. Uh, my name is Samesh Mithi from Teach for Malaysia, and I really like the point about the measurability of either high order groups like Solomy and ESD curriculum. Uh, I'd like to learn a bit more about the Mongolia example. Uh, I'd like to chat more what they did in practice that then that led that to higher uh, student outcomes. I'm uh, sorry, the, 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 the Finnish example? The Mongolia. Oh, the Mongolia. Uh, okay. It, it, it's a love story, I have actually, with this one. I had no idea. What happened was that uh, in the valley where Genghis Khan came from, it was quite a ways out. I, I happened to be in Mongolia, and I was doing some, some lecturing and workshop with the university. And the story came about this school, and I said I would love to go. And uh, so it, it was a long, a long trip. And, and got up there, and they were so proud. The, the, uh, the, it's a school of about a thousand, and the, uh, but what was happening in this valley is it was a Canadian gold mining company and four Australian coal mining companies, and they were working up in the headwaters of, of, the, of the river. Now this valley has been inhabited, for uh, archaeologists say, about 5,000 years. And because of the threat, the, the teachers and parents and so on decided that they would just focus largely on delivering math and, and history and geography and, and, and so on around this particular issue about the future and the threat. The teachers even wrote their own curriculum. And uh, so it was kind of in line with the national curriculum, but there uh, I wish I don't have the, the pictures, but they're all textbooks at the, the different grade levels because it was kindergarten to grade 12 school. And uh, <clears throat> over a period of three years, they just rose, boom, boom, and right up to the top. The students just, and the teachers, every, it, was, it was a unifying force within it. Now the story why I so love it is that a farmer found out that I was there and asked if I would come and visit him at his farm. So they organized the four wheel and went through the snow. And I'm looking at camels in the snow, which is not, you know, I've seen snow, I haven't seen camels in the snow before. Anyway, I got there and, and he was very gracious. We sat in his, in his, his yurt. And through the interpreter, he said, I have a question I need to ask you. He said, this valley has been inhabited 5,000 years. He said, these, these mines, he said, the people who, who run these mines, they, they must be educated people. He said, some of them have master's degrees or this uh, doctor or PhD or something. He was going he said, what kind of an education system would prepare engineers and, and, and educated people who would destroy a civilization of 5,000 years for other people? A, a very profound question. And, and uh, so I, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a question, I think, for not only higher education, but for all education. So when we moved in, that's why I'm so influenced with STEM. It's, it's not just for anything. Okay? 
I, I think we, we need to, to, how do we take STEM and, and add not only the arts for STEAM, but to philosophy and, 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 and uh, moral judgment and value? And what do we really need? So anyway, that, that's, that, that, that's my story. It, it was a you can have El Marie and the lady beside him. Thank you, Prof. from Elmery from MCI and my publication for an inspiring talk. Um, Dave Perkins in his book, Life Worthy Li Living, I don't know if you've seen it, the project called the uh, Project Zero um, leader, um, he raised the question also about curriculum and who makes the decisions on what goes into a curriculum. And you referenced the Finnish model of the, th the three thirds input national environment. How do you how do you reconcile this input from the local, the people themselves into the need for a national assessment and monitoring of outcomes? You know, you want the local input and you want that, yet at the same time there's this drive for overall monitoring and evaluation. How do you what would you start and bring it together? Thank you. Yeah. Um, Basically, there are local school boards. Okay? So and you have the, the National Board of Education, then you have the Ministry of Education, which is the political branch, the National Board, which are the, sort of the professionals, and it all has to be approved in the end. But the, uh, the rationalization of the local is that each step down becomes the bigger vision and purpose, that sort of thing. And then how do you how do you implement that in a meaningful way? So that because you have to be a, a little concerned that you don't if you're within a school that you you end up with a uh, a fairly radical group of people who want to take over public education and just bring in their own uh, perspective. So there has to be guidelines. But we know that the involvement of parents in their school it really is crucial and makes a huge, a huge difference. So working out in, 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 uh, in Finland, they are blessed with very highly involved. Every teacher, even a teacher in preschool, you must have a master's degree. And they're well paid and well respected. And, and they, they, the teachers themselves know how to, uh, how to handle that. But it's uh, reaching out so that parents and, the, and their teachers feel ownership over, and responsibility. It's not just ownership, but the responsibility for, for their school and take great pride in what they, how they deliver it and how they organize the school. Okay. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Alina. Um, I'm really glad that you shared uh, with us the purpose of education. Um, when you said, um, why are we educating our people? Um, it's, is it to know, to do, to be, or to live together with others? And I think we've spent a really long time um, on measuring to know because that's the easiest way for us to measure our kids. It's a binary, one and zero, you know or you don't. Um, so as a teacher, we're told to backwards plan a lot of our things in classroom. Um, what, how would you describe the product of the ESG? What, how, do we, how do we describe the kids that come out from uh, 21st century education? That's number one. And on behalf of all the teachers, uh, what can I do today uh, before I go into classrooms after the break um, so that I could implement this with my kids right now, um, today? Hmm. You asked for a hard question. <laughs> When you said to know, that's the nice and easy one, right? And that's, that's where I, I would think 80% of the world's schools are stuck. Uh, to know and to do. To be? I don't know. You know, at what point do you examine that? Is it Friday afternoon? At the end of the year? 
is it after graduation of school? Is it the end of their life? Because what we need to understand is that there are some profound bigger issues in education, and we have to learn to trust. I like the idea of trust in schools. <laughs> the, I would like to clear up one one point that I, I don't I don't think I, I, I made well enough as I was trying to rush through. Currently, we are looking at the whole child and the, the lower, you know, to know what to do, to be, to live together. Things are changing, though, and with 21st century education, it's realizing that it's not just about the whole child. It's about the whole society. And that is a huge shift where we need education for sustainable development, global citizenship, and some of this broader aspect. Not that we forget the whole child. No, that, that's, that's at the heart, but it's not enough. We can't just have a group of people in this planet sharing the spaceship Earth who are simply focused on themselves and being all they can. It's how do we move from me to me and, and uh, that, that's, that is a large change. When I showed you the whole thing on well-being, did you notice the work in Finland today it is the subjective individual well-being? Now what I'm trying to do is to work with them to look at societal well-being. If we have everyone pursuing their own well-being, what will we have? So it, it, it's that societal one. But maybe over coffee, you and I could talk a little bit more. And, and I could, you know, pinpoint a bit more as to what you're asking. Thanks, though, for that. Thank you. Um, my name is Satina, formerly from the Ministry of Education. Uh, yes, um, I, I was. It, it was a very thank you very much for the top provoking uh, presentation. I was quite interested in looking at uh, your perspective. Basically, we have 17 goals under SDG uh, 2030, and we have seven targets, and it is uh, agreed by all nations all over the world. But uh, we are also aware that uh, each country, nations, whether they are developing or underdeveloped. They are at a different level of uh, aspiration, whether they are still addressing the issue of access, quality, or equity for that matter. And um, I, I'm just wondering, I just uh, had the privilege of uh, meeting some of these uh, trade unions in December on this, this matter. How actually does the whole the, the, I mean, the United Nations looking at it in measuring the success at the end, by 2030, if we are able for Malaysia, for example, uh, we have our education blueprint, which is uh, almost, it's already there. We can actually match it with all the 17 goals, for example. And under SDG 4, education is encompassing the whole thing. I'm quite keen to know, actually, uh, for Malaysia, for example, we, uh, we, our system is such that we also have the indigenous people, which uh, the purpose of education, as you say, probably for them, it is not about getting a good job. It's not about going to do my PhD, but it is about managing my, my probably my community within the area where they stay, which which I think uh, is one aspect that should be should be seen. Then you, you touch also on the um, PPP arrangement. The private public is one of the prerequisite for this to be successful. Uh, I think this is one of the things that is for for our country. It is a big issue. I think from outside, before I know from outside, I can see this is one of the biggest challenges actually that we do, because uh, trusting is one thing, uh, which I think our country, country uh, can see that we have moved forward. But it is so much of theoretical. There is a disconnect there. When the actual implementation and initiation of actually uh, things that we want to do, there is a disconnect because the policy does not allow certain things to be done. 
Therefore, we waste resources like some of the schools are not being used, but cannot be used by the private sectors, for example. Can you tell us how does how do other countries they are already successful in doing some of these things? You know, probably we can learn from them. Probably countries like um, you know, of course, we cannot talk about Finland. Uh, they are different. Their formula cannot be applied in Malaysia, for example. Probably, if you could probably share that thought. Thank you so much. Mm. That's another one. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> first of all, the, the targets that are put up are negotiated by, uh, by countries themselves. They are agreeing on, on what are some of the standards. And I think everyone in the world knows that uh, they're coming from, from different, different starting points. Uh, we have, as I say, uh, even, even in my country, I would say 50% of the teachers have master's degrees, and, and uh, you know, we have large numbers of indigenous people that we can't, we can't do very well with. We have just, it's not that hard, it's we don't know what to do, and, and so that's a research program that I'm starting now is the sequel to that other, the one on the 18 high scoring visa countries, how can we work using ESD with indigenous? But they're again uh, the issue. Do they want? What what do they want? What is the purpose of their education? And if we are really successful, could we be destroying their cultures? So these are, are our profound questions. So different different uh, there will be targets that everyone will record on, and then there will be national targets. So I, I would assume. Uh, that, that Malaysia will set its own targets for 4.1, 4.2, 4, you know, and, and work around that way. Um, I'm sorry, what was the, there was another question in there. There was the, the targets. Uh, every country looks after its own education, and yes. Let me take, say one more very quickly. I was the keynote speaker uh, at uh, World Education Day about five years ago in Paris, and there was a teacher there that was brought in by Education International, which is the world's teachers union. And this person uh, was from uh, Togo, and he explained that his pay was he got a, a gallon, or, I'm sorry, a liter of petrol for every hour he taught. Imagine, that was his pay. But he said, I'm happy with that because my real work is that I have a motorbike and, and I'm a, motor, a motorbike taxi driver. And, and so if I get free gasoline, well, how can you base an education system on people who drop in and I'll teach for a while to get some gasoline and go? So to hold Togo up, alongside Finland or alongside, you know, some of those other high-scoring uh, countries. It, it, it's totally immoral. But we have to get the press and people to start looking at, um, well, in, in a way, yes, how well is the Ministry of Education in your country serving you? What percentage? I was pleased to hear one of them. You know, it, it, it is the big budget. It is the, the, the goal and the target. And how, how do we move forward? Uh, so the comparison. And then the whole idea of PPP, that was the other thing, I'm sorry. That, that. <clears throat> that, you're right, it is controversial in some places. And then I think that what I like about this one is the central curriculum development and so on. It's not just a wealthy school in a wealthy neighborhood getting the local business to put more money into a wealthy, wealthy school, where you really stretch the inequity and social justice, you know, even beyond where that, that band is going to snap. The idea that the, what is being learned and, and, and being shared, I think, uh, the thousands of teachers that I heard yesterday that have received benefit of the training. All of what has been learned in the Malaysian perspective is available for the Ministry of Education, for 
other schools and so on, and hopefully soon um, being shared within faculties of education so that others would be able to, uh, able to use it. The information is valuable because it's in a Malaysian context. It isn't an expert from Canada. An expert from Finland coming in and just say, here's what you do, here's how you do it. How you do it. Every country is so unique and, and their starting points and so on. And that's why I, with PISA, just publishing the ranking doesn't begin to tell the story. It's like our report cards doesn't really tell the story. If, we, if, we're, if we're going to be teaching the whole child, where does that show up in the report card? Where does the emotional and social go? Right now, we're at the only place that we say, you know, in the beginning of the blueprint, and we say at the beginning of it, this is what's important to the whole child. But we give them a mark in math, reading, science, and so on. The only time we report on what we say is so important, the purpose of education is in a parental interview. And, and the child who needs it the most, their parents don't come. Or don't speak the language of the people. Anyway, sorry, I don't want to Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Good morning. I'm Jeffrey Park from University of Tungkot, Taraman. The last few slides caught my attention. The one on the car with all the past assembled. Assemble. Yeah, yeah uh, it sort of reflects the multidisciplinary uh, situation that we're in now. And uh, the 17 goals of the SDG also reflect uh, a lot of multi dimensional aspects, multi variable, multi discipline. Uh, how do we solve that? Uh, in the business sector, we had this problem. And uh, we change vertical organizations to horizontal. We improve the value chain. We cut off all the silos. But that was a pressure because we had a profit motive. We have, we have globalization to take care of. And we have to cut down costs. But in the education sector, which is so important now for ESD, how do we get everyone to cut down their silos, come together? Who would be the leader? Is it the Ministry of Education? And uh, with all these uh, silos around us, how do we actually start? Who is going to lead this? And then uh, this thing done. Right. I'll put down the phone call on how we talk about how we break down the silos in higher education. Because I know that's your here's your, 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 your. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 it's a whole different way of looking at things. Because most teachers teach the way they were taught. And that, that's what the, the time of the faculty of education it, um, it influences you somewhat, but not a whole lot in, in most countries. I don't know about here. I'm, I'm talking generally. Now, <clears throat> so you put away that book and open up this book. And the idea of how do we do phenomena-based learning and, and, and dealing with real issues takes a fair bit of skill. So in, in primary grades, it's fairly easy. Grades, uh, primary, you know, in, in grades one, two, three, you do that kind of thing. But once you get up to where we have to give grades on different disciplines, then we separate things out. And we do teach the disciplines, and as time goes on, it gets worse. Okay. You know, the farther up you go, to the point where you can fail because you don't know one little part of one discipline, and, and uh, now your schooling is in jeopardy. So, trying to to bring things uh, together in a school in a K through 12, uh, we need to first of all we need uh, some direction from the Ministry of Education that. Uh, after we experiment in a few places, some kind of a directive coming down to say at least two or three times during the year, there will be a group, uh, group work, collaborative work, and here's an evaluation scheme for that particular kind of uh, group work that works in holistically and so on. In the private sector, yes, you, you do have a, 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 a you do have to stick. You know, you don't 
don't have in, in public education. In, in, in the private sector, the whole thing of what interests my boss fascinates me. You, know, you, <laughs> you want to keep your job. In, in the public system, it, it would interest my boss, well, maybe I should just keep out of it. It's going to be extra work. And, and, and that's the way it should be. So the, the whole way of trying to engage people and teachers in working together is a real issue. First of all, we have set boxes that you work in. Most schools don't even have a place where you can bring where you can bring two or three groups together to work in an open concept and, and so on. So there's the physicality of the whole thing. I think that uh, trying to to get very where I see it, to get different ministries working together, that has to be there, there's usually a a, uh, an upper ministry, okay. whether it's Ministry of Finance or a Treasury or Department or something, or the, the Deputy Prime Minister, or even in the case of Finland and India, the Prime Minister himself are responsible for sustainable development and help people to start working together. Healthcare, for instance, it's one, roughly one tenth the cost to deliver health education through schools as it is through public health departments. So how can we get the accurate information from the public health departments into the hands of our health and physical education teachers so we, do, we can deliver that? This is going to require collaboration. It's going to require collaboration between our TVET program okay, and uh, the Ministry of, uh, of Employment and so on. So, Again, we, we need senior leaders to come up with, a, with another uh, roadmap to the blueprint as to what are some things that we, where we can experiment. Not the whole thing, but just start experimenting and find out things that work and, and then build on that. But, so you're, you're the one that's trying to bring multidisciplinary and yeah. transdisciplinary and higher ed. There is a book by Edward Wilson called On Silence. One of the quotations is said, fragmentation of education today is an artifact of scholarship. In other words, we are the one who created all this fragmentation, science, social science, arts, and you know. And this is what started it all. Right? And therefore, we now need to, again, combine this, what we call the convergence of knowledge. But we begin to understand now, particularly in the context of global warming, climate change, there's no one particular discipline that will solve this problem. You need to come together and get this what we call transdisciplinary kind of thinking. Not only interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, it's transdisciplinary where you begin to break the boundaries and the borders and the silos. And knowledge now becomes one. And this, apart from this lifelong learning, which is basically an important thing. But there's also now coming idea of life-wide learning, that we might eat. In other words, it's not just about knowing the death, but also knowing the breadth of it. People are beginning to understand that knowledge are interconnected. They are organically interconnected. They are not artificially interconnected. So it is the scholars again now, academicians like us, who needs to make a case for this that the silos are no longer, quote unquote, relevant to the modern 21st century learning. And indeed, I think Chuck mentioned about the phenomenon that, that uh, this, the, 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 this Finland schools are, are doing. They are, they are, I think they are getting rid of all the subjects. They are looking at the phenomena. How do you then solve the phenomena? Or how do you discover the phenomena? Coming from various angles and trying to understand it as a holistic sum rather than uh, parts and parts of it. Did I read that correct? Yeah. yeah. They're really downplaying the role. They, they still keep the disciplines yeah. and, and so on, but they, they aren't, um, aren't that, that important. That, that's no, the marking schemes and so on are more around their collaborative work on the discipline. If we're about to close, I, I would like one minute to close on Okay, I think there are two more questions. I'll just take two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Or three more questions, okay? Three ladies. <laughs> oh, one man, okay. <laughs> one, two, three, four. And you will close it up. Yeah. Okay. 
Can I have your question, please? You'll be very popular, Deja. Thank you a lot. From <laughs> Yeah, it was a refreshing session, so I just have a reflection, it's not a question. I'm Mala from My School Foundation. Basically, we are teaching values and attitude for students who drop out from school, so and those who are expelled from school. So I don't know how do we actually fit in into the ESD scheme. And secondly, my question is like, people always see us as rehabilitators and not educators. But after seeing your slide, I was so impressed and I just, it just, I just reflected myself and I was thinking that that's what I'm doing. It's like the whole team uh, back in my foundation, what we are doing is trying to get these boys to become responsible citizens so they do not harm and hurt others. It's basically for the societal well-being as you well mentioned just now. So, but when we say we teach values, people say, no, you are doing training. When we say we are trying to educate them, people say, no, you are trying to rehabilitate them. I just don't know why um, when we tackle this kind of target group students, uh, we are looked differently compared to the former educators. So are we re-educators or are we educators? But let me just make a, a quick comment on that. It, it depends on what country I'm in. When I, 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 if, if I bring up, I hate me picking on the United States, but uh, I'm a Canadian, so yeah. But there's no one around, so anyway. If, if I'm in India and I say, hey, look, it, 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 it's largely a, an issue around values. And everyone, oh no, yes. Say yes. It's only very rude. But when I'm in the United States and I say, let's go, uh, immediately hands go up, whose values? You're not putting your values on my head. And, and the, re, the way in which uh, we look at it is I always start with the Earth chart. Now, for those of you who don't know it, remember, mark it down. It's the earthcharter.org. Now, it started in, in, uh, in the 1980s, and it's people from all around the world had access, but no politicians, to write a charter for the rights of the Earth itself. So, and I, I, I share this and say, which values in here do you disagree with? And almost nobody finds anything. And, and this was the, this is the, the people of the world are saying these are the universal values that we should work in. And I say, if you find anything you don't like in there, okay, take, don't don't deal with that one, but deal with the rest of them. But we do need training, and I love organizations that, that does get training into how do you present values and values clarification so that people arrive and build their own values, and, and, and it's, it's not so much as you know. It, 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 it's it's got to be that a, a, a lifelong uh, validation. Right, thanks. Hello. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Azlina from UNICEF and I have a quick question. Um, I just, um, we've been talking about lifelong education and life-wide education, but I, I noticed that you had mentioned PISA as just an indicator of um, an education outcome. Uh, what is your comment? I'd be interested to know about this over-reliance on um, measurable outputs um, uh, test, let's say PISA, which can be narrowly interpreted as an outcome of um, quality education when we know that there are many different interpretations to quality. And a lot of um, educational outcomes are non-measurable. Mm -hmm. And it renders those which are non-measurable less important. Thank you. But I, I tried to do it with, with, with piece of what it really was. It was an indicator of, of one of the indicators of one aspect of math, language, and, and science of, of, of quality. Now, others look at, at quality in, in, in different ways. Uh, some countries look at how well do we score on PISA versus the amount of money we put into it, you know, so it's value. It, it's a, another indicator of, of quality. So each country will come up with, with, uh, with its own quality. I went and I talked with the, the, the people in OECD that run it, and I said, can we get some sustainability factors built in the PISA? And they said, no, uh, that it would be impossible. 
the PISA is, is run by countries. Uh, there are 20 countries that are on the board of directors and they decide and what questions are going to be asked and all, all of this. I went around, Japan sits on it, Korea sits on it, and so on. And I talked to the, the representatives about getting sustainability in, but they each came from their own discipline, usually math or science. And they said, sustainability, no, no, it, 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 it's about science. And so they saw it in silos. But the people at OECD said, look, what you're doing in trying to develop some kind of, of assessment of what sustainability does in the way of quality in this much bigger atmosphere. They said, that's, please go there. And so we did the first little bit. We need to do much more in the way of testing and certainly getting the message out there uh, and going. But, Yes, PISA is important, and we need to deal with it, but we have to understand it's an indicator, it's not the purpose. Because too many people think that the purpose of education is to get a PISA mark, a high score, and to move my country to two levels up there. The lady in the back, and uh Good morning, uh, thank you, Professor Wolf Essex. Um, just have one question from, from Steve to Stan. Um, the position of arts and education, I'm not sure that with at all that the country from Asia that one has yes, that's one. So could you share with us any you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I'm glad you revisited it. You know, when I when I uh, when I give it an hour long lecture, it's hard to cover everything, but uh, the, uh, the arts are so important in, in, uh, uh, to us and as is culture. Where is culture in the piece? It's not there. So that's what we have to understand the limitation. The arts and ESD are. The simplest thing, I, not long ago, I watched, uh, and this is around climate change. And two young people were standing, one was a bucket of water, and one was you know, acting, uh, dying of thirst, can I have water in the purpose? No. Can I have water, please? No. And then he takes the bucket of water and he throws it, and, and dumps the water all over. And when he was showing, and, and the kid at the end, but he didn't get it, and he was showing, and, and the kid again, but he didn't get it. So it was the idea of climate change from drought to flood, and neither one is useful for us, and, and what are we doing? It was just that little bit of, of the arts. Posters, you know, in South America, a huge poster painted on the wall by, by acting groups, and it showed it was a huge cat with the, the turn on the top and the cat, and then coming out of it was bottled water so the poor couldn't afford to buy water and so on. The images that are that go out there, I collect art and, and I have some, some fantastic ones. I think that that's where the heart, the soul, and, and, and in Toronto, it's our art industry, the arts in general, the theater and music and so on. You hear an awful lot of Canadian uh, recording stars and I don't know if they make it here. But the arts industry is one of the largest. It's bigger than lumbering. And yet it's under the radar of the number of people who are involved. And, and, and look at the environmental impact of the arts versus, uh, versus lumbering. You know, it, it especially just not sustainable lumbering. So thank you. I, 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 uh, I think the arts have an important, very important role. Hi, Professor. Uh, I'm Dr. Rosie from Institute of Teacher Education, District of Education, Savage Island. We have met before last time uh, to discuss about the Teacher's Project for 2017 and the Basic Project Section. So, um, I lived in China for two years uh, and worked for Malaysia Embassy and the Education Malaysia. So, during that uh, years, uh, I used to visit most of uh, China's school, uh, high school or secondary school, and surprisingly, 
during my visit, uh, when I asked them about 21st century pedagogical or the health system, they say no, they don't make the uh, 21st century education for the uh, system. And when, when we had this last week, Ministry of Education China, uh, I just realized that there are no 21st century pedagogical uh, system implemented in the system. So my question is about, is pedagogical concept in education is based on country, culture, climate, language, or environment, which China I think is the best good example that we put on sustainability on that matters in the education. So that is my first question. Could you pass that over to me very quickly? Let me yeah. let, let me look at it because I, 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 I couldn't really follow exactly. It's a long question. Oh, you want to see that? Is it? Is it? What is it? Yeah. It's about the pedagogical concept. Yeah. In education, is it really based on the yeah, country culture or language which in China? Oh, in China? Yeah, in China. <laughs> I don't know. My question. I have another question. I, I, really, yeah, I really don't know about the rest of China. Uh, I, I've been working now for, uh, I guess, uh, 11 years with the people in, in, in mainly Beijing, Shanghai. On, on the East Coast. They have built 100 uh, ESD experimental schools, and they have a thousand schools where they are, because they realize their problems are so huge. Their social, environmental, and economic problems are, are, are tremendous. You know, they're, they're sort of on, on the edge of things. But going in these, these schools, and they've done wonderful research on, on, uh, on, on the, the impact tell you over coffee, I have seen things in China that I've not seen in any other country around how they are moving with ESD, because there's a small sliver, a small branch that is putting down in, in the research on what can be done and how, how quickly can we upgrade. The big thing is climate change, uh, because we can't breathe. You know, it's not because they're a big heart, but we can't breathe in British in so many days of the year. And they realize they're shutting down the coal plant. Who would have thought four months ago that the United States will become the, the evil energy empire right? and China would come to the rescue of the world around the planet? That's what I want to say. Yeah, if I could very quickly uh, just end up. I, 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 we're talking more about talking. Okay, thank you, Professor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just one more. I think um, what, I, what I want to say is, is to bring hope. Uh, um, and I, I always uh, promise to end, uh, I gave a promise to a little girl to end my, most of my talks this way. I think most of you have heard of the ecological footprint. It came from, it's, it's the impact that we make in, in our daily life on the planet as an individual. So we have the number of people times technology times lifestyle times you know to calculate our our impact. Now that came from a uh, um, Dr. Uh, William Reese and his graduate student at the University of British Columbia. It is now pretty well around the world. It's about 20 years old and it's and it's taught in, in many many schools. One time it was being taught in India. And uh, so here we're kind of a low tech approach to it. Uh, on, on the left with the yellow one, you have uh, this is the, the world that we have. This 1.3, 1.4 is the rate at which we are consuming our natural resources on the planet. And if we all live in the world in the same way as we live in North America, we need four planets. Uh, we haven't found them yet. <laughs> and the idea that we're all going to go to another planet uh, is a bit off. So they, they were they're teaching this, and little girl in grade four said, but I have hands. I can do something about my footprint. And the teacher recognized the imagery of the ecological handprint as the antidote to the ecological footprint. And she had the kids draw their hands, and so on, and we can all do this in primary school. But the idea of creating in their minds an ecological
biological handprint. And then she went to see the Center for Environmental Education, which is the largest NGO uh, uh, that, uh, in the world, actually, that they're in 20, 20 uh, like a national NGO. There are 27 cities and uh, like 400 employees and so on. And they do massive work. They just converted a train to travel through uh, through all of India on climate change and biodiversity. But at any rate, they work with, with the, the, to create the idea of the ecological handprint. It's called Hands for Change. And it's sweeping not only Asia, Africa, and up into North America. <coughs> I tell you this story because I find such hope and inspiration in the fact that we never know where uh, where the next bit of, of good news can come from, where ideas can come from. So you have Bill Reese, who is the PhD and so on in in the university specializing in sustainability and as a little girl in grade four. But it took a teacher to recognize it. And it took an NGO to bring it into fruition. And now ministries of education are promoting it. It is the partnership that is coming together to bring hope and inspiration. And I think it's an essential part of Education 2030, our hope and inspiration. Thank you all for joining before, before I end the session, I would like to share three reflections from the, from the uh, address that was given by Professor Robin. One, I think the blueprints that we've got, the interest at the level and the higher level, were all launched before the Sustainable Development Goal were announced. So I'm not too sure when you talk about higher purpose or a new higher purpose of education, the blueprint does or does not cover it. I think that's one reflection. Right. The second reflection is basically when you talk about PISA as an indicator, not the purpose of it. So I want to extend that to the whole idea of KPIs there. We're all so, so sucked in. You know, the KPIs are good, but it is not the purpose of education. So we really need to moderate that a little bit. Einstein does say not everything that counts counts. <coughs> yeah? So we need to look at the KPIs and this number of games that we are playing, including the rankings, something that we need to reflect on if we want to be, uh, achieve the higher purpose of education as such. And the third one I think is very much more fundamental when you talk about well being. In this country, we talk about Sajakra all the time. Salab Sajakra, Sajakra Malaysia, Kedah Sajakra, you know, all this Sajakra everywhere. But is it well-being to us? And has that been sort of embedded in the kind of education that we've got in the context of just what the, the, the Finland people are doing? Yeah? In our education philosophy, there's this word, kusajatra andiri. Yeah? We want to achieve kusajatra andiri. But we have not interpreted that in the context of sustainability as been shown by, 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 uh, by Professor Hawking. So these are, the, these are the three main things that I think we need to reflect on if you want to make change in education in the context of sustainable development and sustainability for the future, which to me is very fundamental and is so important. So on that note, Chuck, thank you very much for giving us this uh, you know, uh, platform to think and certainly we will engage you again. And please, I also want to thank you for your participation, your active participation. And please give a round of applause to you. Very rarely we have uh, you know, a million person like this who come here, and I hope this will also move the environment the ASAT that is sponsoring this to a new VISTA as far as education and the legal setting. Thank you very much. Uh,